we see Saudi Arabia as the country of oil and strict Islam, where women wear veils and kisses are edited out from films. But suddenly, there was a new crown prince. He says he wants to reform the country, women get more rights and tourists will soon be welcome. The country has become less dependent on oil. At the same time, the people are ruled with an iron fist. One wrong word can have serious consequences. In this year of changes, I travel around the country and follow the developments on the inside through the eyes of the citizens. Are they just empty promises or is Saudi Arabia really able to change? The pride of Saudi Arabia is the Arabian horse. It is fast, nimble, and it has a lot of stamina. The Saudis admire this animal to no end. Nou, het is echt een prachtig dier. Fantastisch. En die bewondering, dat gaat eigenlijk best wel ver terug. Dat was met de Bedouinen in dit land die, die dit paard verder hebben ontwikkeld. Dat was Abdulaziz Al Saud, die op zijn Arabische paard met zijn mannen Riyadh binnenviel. En uiteindelijk dus de macht in dit land ook, ook greep. En hij bouwde het koninkrijk van Saudi-Arabië op. تتبادل أنت وياه على إحساس، فزي ما تقول ما نقول حب نعدي درجة الحب نقول أخذ مرحلة الشغف. هذا شهاد رمز سعودي؟ والله شيء أكيد إنه بيكون رمز للدولة السعودية، لأن والدنا ووحدة الجزيرة العربية بفضل الله ثم بفضل الملك عبد العزيز عربية، فأعتقد إنه رمز رمز رمز. الهسان مصدر فحرك؟ نعم موجودة الفرس أجدر. ممكن نشوف هذا الهسان؟ تفضل يلا مشينا. آه يا فيلم يا ميا very very nice. كيف أصبح قد جميل؟ الخيل بصفة عامة عشان تثبت جماليته يعني مقسمة على خمس أشياء اللي هو الرأس العنق الجسم الحركة الشخصية العربية شخصية يعني الخيل العربية عنده شخصية عنده هوية عربية لما أشوف الشخص هذا أقول هذا عربي أو هذا أوروبي نفس الخيل، الخيل برضه فيها فيها الشيء هذا، فيها فيها الجاذبية هذه. هذه كلها لها تقييمة وتقييمة يعني يرفع معدل الجمال فيها. جمعها لنا. بالفحل هذا، بسم الله عليه ما شاء الله يعني يعد من أجمل الخيول العربية. This horse has always been linked to the country's rich and powerful. Many of them have their own thoroughbred Arabian horse. Every year they gather at the largest horse festival in eastern Saudi Arabia. This is a party for the elite. Now, if you want to see Saudi Arabia, then this is the place. Here comes the money by elkaar. Nou, dat is een groep mannen die zijn ingehuurd om die paarden op te zwepen. Het zijn nogal gepassioneerde paarden. Een beetje onstuimig ook af en toe. En dat willen ze graag zien. Er hangt ook nog prijzengeld aan vast. Maar het gaat vooral om de eer, namelijk wie heeft het mooiste paard van Saudi-Arabië. 
Dat is ook een schoonheidswet zeker. Zoals we misverkiezingen hebben, is dat hier uh, voor de paarden. Maar altijd al bestaan voor alle rassen hoor. Uh, exterieurkeuring, zo, zo noem ik het. Dat heet zo. Correct. Ja. Zo'n toppaard, hè? Wat, wat kost dat eigenlijk? Uh, een werkelijk toppaard, een witte raaf. Een witte raaf. Uh, ja, 3 miljoen, 4 miljoen dollar. Maar wie kan er eigenlijk zo'n paard betalen? Ik bedoel echt het topsegment. Ah, topsegment, ja, ja, dat zijn enkel de paarden. Dat zijn die dat zijn kunnen vrolijk doen. Er is straks in de koningsklasse paarden die 10 jaar en, en ouder zijn. Wie is voor u een van de kanshebbers? Wel, een van de kanshebbers is misschien wel uh, de prins uh, met een van zijn paarden. Die kan zitten uh, dik in. Security is taken up a few notches, awaiting the arrival of Prince bin Nayef. He was once regarded as the crown prince. He wants to win, and if he doesn't, he will simply buy the horse that won. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to announce uh, the medal winning uh, mayor. Uh, a very, very exciting and interesting uh, competition. They were all above uh, the 90 point mark. No one knows how many princes there are exactly. It is estimated that there are several thousand. Waarschijnlijk is het zijn eigen paard. The house of Saud reigns supreme. Many of the most important jobs are assigned to family members. Prince bin Naif is governor of the eastern province. <laughs> Bijna een soort heiligheid in dit land gewoon. Want hij wordt echt helemaal afgedekt. 50 man aan bodyguards heeft hij. Nou, dit is dus typisch het huis van, uh, van Saoud. Uh, onaantastbaar, onschendbaar, maar ook onbereikbaar. Questions are not allowed. The royal family's word is law in this country. They have a firm grip on the most important source of income. Oil. Gigantic amounts of it had been found by Western geologists under the Arabian Peninsula's desert plains. Ja, dit is dus Aramco, het grootste oliebedrijf van, uh, van de wereld. En, uh, en ik zit in een Aramco-auto, want die kan niet zomaar het terrein op hier. Het is gewoon een hele. Eigenlijk gewoon een hele stad in een stad. So can we go closer? Of course, please. Uh, this is the first oil well in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The first place where they found oil. Oil, correct. This is the really first place. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, they actually started by drilling 10 wells at that time, 1933. So they drilled well number one, number two, three. For number one, they find just gas and some water. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, no oil. They were totally disappointed. Unlike their neighboring countries, the disappointed Saudis didn't find any oil. But a stubborn American geologist called Max Steinecke kept searching. His idea was to drill deeper. So Max, he decided just randomly to come back to wall number seven, and then he drilled deeper up to like 1,441 meters. Wow, then the oil started to struck. 
So the history could be different for us if we were the one who found the oil, but it was the Americans. It was the Americans, and that's where we had the concession agreement with the American geologists. And that's where they named the Aramco company mm -hmm. Aramco, which came from Arabian American Oil Company. Since they are the one who discovered the oil, so it was like 50% investment. And now? 50. No, now it's been uh, Saudi. Totally Saudi? Totally Saudi. And where does the revenue of Aramco go? It's government-owned uh, company. Also to the royal house? Yes, of course, because it's government-owned. Uh, Correct. I see that Alina is taken aback. She just admitted that a lot of the oil revenues flow to the royal family. How much is a secret? Aramco is the most profitable company in the world. It is worth almost two trillion dollars. The oil discovery also meant that more Westerners entered the country. They took up residence behind the closed doors of Aramco, together with Saudi employees. How long do you work for Aramco? For Aramco now, 20 years. On the compound? I used to, mm -hmm. but I moved out. Mm -hmm. Yes, I used to. I like it there because it's more convenient for me. I have my car, I'm driving, moving around, so that was a good thing. So you're driving a car on the compound? Oh, yes, yeah? of course. And outside the compound? No. So it, the life inside the compound is different as outside the compound? Absolutely. We call it the Little America because we have all the facilities, even the greens, the plants, the gardens, the houses are built like in American style, so women can drive. Yeah. So it's absolutely little America. But to be honest, I traveled in Saudi Arabia now for weeks. You are the first one, first female, that tells me that she's working for 20 years. Because it was an Arabian American oil company, and at that time we hired so many Americans a large number of Americans, um, females and males, of course. So, and that is the big influence. So Aramco had, did, uh, had a role in the emancipation of Saudi women? Yes. Yes? Yes, of course, and we we're proud of that. Alina is quite frank, and so she's no longer allowed to guide us. For years, a veil of secrecy has hung over the compound. Many Saudis consider this place to be depraved. Men and women mingled freely here. The strictly Islamic society took offense at this. We have to hide our camera. Dit ziet er allemaal heel goed uit, goed georganiseerd ook. Uh, man en vrouw door elkaar, maar ook allerlei uh, mooie voorzieningen voor kinderen. Ook een bioscoop hier achter me, cafeetjes, restaurantjes. Het is eigenlijk een heel ander, andere wereld hier. En ondertussen moet ik ook even goed om me heen kijken uh, dat er geen mensen van de beveiliging zijn die ons misschien staande kunnen houden hier. De Saudische staat die ziet dat eigenlijk helemaal niet zitten, dat wij hier filmen. En dat heeft te maken met dat er hier toch een ander leven is dan buiten de muren van dit bedrijf. From 1933 onwards, the Americans were involved with the oil extraction. This enabled the countries to strike a wonderful deal when they needed each other most. Nou, bitter leek wat daar ligt, daar verderop. Daar werd in 1945 een cruciale overeenkomst uh, gesloten. Op een marineschip tussen de Amerikaanse president Roosevelt en de Saudische koning uh, Abdulaziz. En die overeenkomst, dat is eigenlijk een scharnierpunt in de geschiedenis van Saudi-Arabië. En ik denk in de wereldgeschiedenis. After 1945, America needed lots of oil. Saudi Arabia was able to deliver it. And the country's founder, King Abdulaziz, saw it as an opportunity to spread his faith. The Saudis agreed to exchange oil for money, but they would decide how it was spent. <laughs> 
It's the annual classic car show we do every year. Uh, it's a gathering for people to enjoy the cars, to enjoy the beautiful designs of the 50s and 40s classic cars. And the Saudis like cars? Yeah, they love cars. Mm -hmm. We used to buy pickups so we can carry stuff, uh, sheep, camels and people in the pickup. Because so, you didn't find oil yet then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, the oil was found in Saudi Arabia from the 30s, but it yeah. was not uh, as much as today. Yeah. So thanks God for all what we have, alhamdulillah. The discovery of oil led to an abundant supply of money, and most of it ended up here, in Dria, a town near Riyadh. Ever since the founding of Saudi Arabia, this is where power and faith converge. I heard that also some cars are from the royal family. Yeah. That's true? Yes. Uh, King Salman, to support the youth and mm -hmm. the show, uh, he accepted to present four of his personal cars that he used to drive in the 70s. Is it possible to buy a car from a royal family? It's possible, but it's rare, so it's expensive. So this is for the rich Saudiers? Um, depends how do you find rich. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you say if you have one million you are rich, but for me maybe a hundred million dollars is a rich guy. <laughs> what is rich for you? A <laughs> hundred million. قالوا نبي نصور مع واحد مليونير. قلت اجيب لكم مليونير. We are lucky. Sattam, the organizer of the auto show, sees one of the truly wealthy walk by. Prince Saud bin Turki Al Saud. You are from the royal family? Yeah. So are you gonna buy a car at uh, the auction? Maybe, why not? Maybe? Maybe, yeah. Which one? The red one. The red one, yeah. yeah. yeah if he likes the red one, he's rich. <laughs> How many princes there are in Saudi Arabia? Maybe four or three, five thousand. Four or three, yeah. five thousand. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of princes, yeah. eh? Yeah. Yeah. You know them all also? Yes, I know Everybody? them all. Not uh, in particular, but uh, I know them all. Can I ask you another question? Yeah. In the family, uh, you are also speaking about the changes. How, how, how is that in the, inside the family? Uh, everybody's happy about it. Yeah? Yeah. Everybody supports also? Yes, we support 200% everything. You can excuse me because you... my son is with Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. No the prince sorry, is extremely you. friendly, but as soon as we talk about the reforms, he has to go. And he doesn't want to talk to me later on either. I feel that we need to be careful. King Salman's car hasn't been sold. His palace is nearby. Fortunately, Satam allows me to get in. He's willing to bring me closer. He knows the town inside out. So we are royal now with the red carpet. We are famous. I'm from Dreya. My grandfather is from Dreya. And also, I'm with the prince of Dreya, he's a close friend. Hello, Am. Hello, sir. Are you ready? With the peace, inshallah. Amen, amen. We see King Salman's country house rise up in the distance. One of the locals I met at the auto show is willing to bring me closer to the palace. Only later do I find out how powerful Mansour al Shahoub is. King Salman. He's there now, King Salman? Yeah. Calling from Saudi Arabia. It's huge, eh? Big, Kabir. Hey. Huh? No. نعم بأسرة آل سعود بدأت الحكم الدولة الدولة السعودية الأولى بدأت من هنا 
Dat is best grappig. Dus het paleis van de huidige koning Salman zit rechts, zeg maar. En het, uh, het paleis van de oude koning, van de eerste koning uh, Saoud, aan de andere zijde van de stad. Dit is dus ook echt de stad waar het allemaal is begonnen hier. So this is the most important city in Saudi Arabia then. هذه أهم مدينة أهم مدينة في 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 لأنها هي بداية التأسيس هي لأنها هي العاصمة الأولى. وسور الدرعية كما تعرفون ويعرف الجميع أن سور الدرعية حصار الدرعية هذا جزء منه السور التاريخي. سور التاريخي؟ أي نعم هذا هذا السور كان محاوط للدرعية ككل هذا جزء منه. Not only is this small city the birthplace of the House of Saud. But it is also here that in the 18th century the alliance was forged between Mohammed ibn Saud and religious leader Sheikh Abdul Al Wahab. This alliance found massive support and led to the Saudi Arabia of today. The royal house of Saud rose to power thanks to Wahhabism, the ultra orthodox Islamic doctrine as state religion. So that was the palace of King Saud. But what about Al Wahhab? هذا مسجد الشيخ محمد بن الوهاب وهذا وسكنه. هذا؟ نعم. وهذا مسجده كان في الوادي هذا الوادي وكان على الوادي. سلام. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله كيف حالكم؟ ولم يكن هناك. حياكم الله يا إخوان. أهلا وسهلا. كيف حالكم؟ To my surprise, we are right next to the mosque. Mansour is the head of an important family in Dariya. Without asking permission, he takes me to the mosque of Abdul Al Wahhab, the religious reformer who introduced Wahhabism three centuries ago. He said that those who didn't follow the true faith could even be fought with violence. These ideas inspired groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS to spread death and destruction. كما تشاهد الآن هذا مسجد الشيخ محمد بن الوهاب بعد بناءه جميع الفروض تؤدى فيه. So there are some groups who are using his ideology to to use violence. They call him an extremist. What do you think about that? غير صحيح الشيخ محمد الوهاب درسنا كتبه وطلعنا على كتبه وذا لم يدعو في يوم الايام لنوع شيء اسمه الجهاد او الارهاب او ما يسمى انه ارهاب او كذا غير صحيح الى مسكنه الى مسجده الى موقعه كله كلام هذا مركب تركيب هو فقط امام مثل إما الاخرين My visit to the mosque reveals a sore spot. The ideology that has been exported using oil money leading to violence in other places has its origins here. Mansour wants to rectify this image. كما ترون مصاحف لا يوجد هناك كما يدعي الغرب ان الشيخ الشيخ محمد عبد الوهاب امر او طلب كتبه او تدرس وكذا Wat het voor mij dan nog verrassend maakt, is dus dat een local uit Dria tegen mij zegt ja, maar dat hele gedachtegoed van hem is verkeerd, verkeerd uitgelegd. Maar als ik dan zie wat voor ellende het heeft veroorzaakt in al die landen waar ik ben geweest, Libië, Syrië, Irak, Afghanistan, kijk hoe vredig het hier is en, uh, en hoe het dus elders wat voor ellende het heeft veroorzaakt. En dat allemaal is begonnen hier in, op deze plek waar die man is geboren en waar hij zijn uh, gedachtegoed heeft verspreid over, uh, over de hele wereld. Dat is toch bizar. The proving fundamentalism that was embraced by many Saudis first damaged the House of Saud itself. As a protest against foreign influences and women's rights, 
such as Aramco's Little America, the unfathomable happens. Mecca, the Saudi holy place, is attacked by a handful of extremists in 1979. I traveled to Jeddah to talk to an editor-in-chief who saw it happen up close and isn't afraid to talk about it. It was a game changer. There was a creeping tide of extremism had come in. But how did it change? Because how, how was it before and how was it before after? We were normal people. And I saw all the James Bond movies in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, with my mother in the 70s and early 80s. And it was totally different before the Sahara came, the awakening came. The Saudi king was shocked. His power rested on the alliance with religious leaders but resistance had grown. The attackers were executed and he had a solution to prevent further uprisings. Wahhabism needed to be followed more strictly. This was called the awakening. So this Sahwar, the awakening that came in 30 years was really uh, disastrous for the Arabs. Yeah. And then the attack came and then everything changed. Yes. And what was the f first thing that changed? I mean, the relegation of women in the background, uh, mm. the mosques used to come and say things wrong, things that were totally alien. I mean, things that didn't even concern us, covering the faces, uh, hellfire, brimstone, born again Muslims. The bad thing on that attack is that the aggressor won. He wanted something that the country gets more conservative. Yes. And he succeeded in that. So he lost the battle, but won the war. It brought in dark clouds. I think it was hijacked by preachers. From then on, religious conservatism had an even tighter grip on Saudi Arabia. Women were forced to cover their faces. Cinemas were closed, while the doors opened for extremism. We have supported many organizations here and there. Uh, there, of course, there are issues, the issue of uh, extremism, the attack on the haram, mm. the, the rising tide of intolerance. Yes, we, we admit we made a mistake. Mm. And then even the Crown Prince said mm. that we made a mistake. And that caused all these problems. Yeah. The extremism reached its apogee during the September 11 attacks. Not far from the editor-in-chief's office, is the birthplace of the man who changed the world. Is this official Bilal route? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is Bilal route. Yeah, the Bin Laden die the world kent is natuurlijk Osama Bin Laden. Misschien wel de bekendste Saudiër ooit. Dit is de wijk waar hij is geboren, is opgegroeid. Hij komt uit een grote familie. Bin Laden's father made his money constructing roads. He was closely tied to the Saudi royal family. After oil was discovered, he was assigned large construction projects. We aren't allowed to film here either. Deze hele wijk was dus in handen van de familie van Bin Laden. Gewoon echt een deel van de stad uh, Jeddah. En deze weg is dus vernoemd naar de familienaam Bin Laden. Hier, dit is dit, 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 het hele complex. Het huis staat er nog. En je ziet een licht oranje kleurig gebouw. Hier is hij dus opgegroeid. En er wonen nog familieleden, maar die worden afgeschermd. Let me walk here. Walk? Walk. Stop here? Yeah. 
This mosque contributed to his radicalization and is closed now. But the effect of the sermons here has changed the way the world views Saudi Arabia forever. Now that the country appears to be opening up, I am invited by Mansour and his son Salah to visit their home. They want to distance themselves from the extremism. Of course, we had all the attacks uh, and uh, all the um, all the war. They don't know, of course. They will link the terrorism with us, which is wrong. But there is a strict form of the Islam in Saudi Arabia. You agree on that? We had some conservative periods, but that doesn't mean that we accept the terrorism or the jihadis or any any part of those uh, of of that ideology. But 9/11 it made a very bad image of Saudi Arabia. Of course, that affects us, and the first people who got hurt are us, and the the attacks of them in Saudi Arabia, and we lived it, and we were scared out of it, and we hated it. Uh, was in Saudi Arabia, more than 60 or 70 attack in Saudi Arabia. And it was bloody, ugly thing that no human can accept ever. Mohammed bin Salman slams the door in the face of extremism. He says he wants to return to moderate Islam of before 1979. This makes him popular among young people. Islam <laughs> The good thing about uh, His Royal Highness, he's, um, he's, uh, we studied at the same school, by the way. Yeah. Do you know him also, yeah. personally? Yes, personal. When we were young, we lived a normal life that the, um, the young population lived, and he heard their needs, and he was one of them. Now, as a leader, he, he's taking us to, to, to what, is, what is called a uh, future. It is Friday. The family, and thus the elite of Saudi Arabia, gathers. I am asked to stay and eat with them. The guests are surprised to see me. Nice to meet you too. Salah. Who are these people? Is it all family? Um, no, no, not all of them are family. We have like uh, architects, engineers, generals. How important is this for the Saudi people? Uh, you find it in all the families. It's very important if anyone needs anything from the other so they can help each other. And... This is the real Gareel. My grandfather now, he was one with the king, late king of the Lazis. Yeah, his name Muhammad Muslim. So the family has a very close tie. They, they served the, the, the country for a long, long, long time. So then I understand the loyalty of you yeah, and the yeah. people to yeah. the kingdom. Now the, 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 you know, the, our parents, our grandparents, they're yeah. passing this loyalty to us, and, and we're going to carry on to my son and, and so forth. This is the protective ring around the royal family. They are most loyal. The question is whether it is possible to criticize the royal family. Like critics on the royal family, is that, well, is that possible? Well, yeah. Yeah. Openly. Openly, yes. W without getting any penalty or... No, no, I mean, critic, I mean, if a critic is within the boundaries of respect, mm -hmm. fine. But you don't go and start shouting and, and bluffing or uh, mm -hmm. saying lies and they will let you go. And if you do, if you do that... If you do that... <laughs> <laughs> you get penalty. I mean, they should be penalized. I mean, mm -hmm. somebody who's not respecting the king or the, the, the laws and everything, he should not be respected. You might get me in trouble now, huh? Of camera, there is clearly a fear to say something wrong, even among the elite. Salah takes me to the place where there are women. He'd rather show me the image 
of the new Saudi Arabia. All of this is paid by the government. We have the Entertainment Authority. Uh -huh. uh, it's a new authority uh, started by... It's called the Entertainment Authority? Yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and they are planning to make 5,500 events like this. It's very crowded, here. Eh? Yeah, it's very crowded. And you see uh, all the kind of the community, the old and the young, girls, ladies and uh, children. But a lot of girls. Yeah. They are happy to be here and uh, to have this uh, opportunity uh, with them. What happened with Saudi Arabia? Well, we have the great crown prince and he's doing a very great uh, job supporting the young population. So people are ready for change? Yeah, they are happy and he's uh, an idol. And uh, does the crown prince also work on better human rights for Saudi Arabia? Yes, he's, he's promised with a good uh, better and, and he's doing very well. What he did in two years, it, it, it takes another country's uh, 100 years to change it uh, this past. For Saleh, the Crown Prince is a synonym for change. The government supports young people financially to start small companies. This only increases the faith in reforms. Is this the new energy in Saudi Arabia? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Because, you know, 70% of Saudi population, they are under 30 years old. Very young population. Very young. And they are, all have this energy to work and they have energy to, to produce things. So nobody can stop the changes. Yes, no one can stop the change. Prince Mohammed bin Salman won't stop. Yes, he, he won't will make it. it go further. I'm sure. Yes, this is my country. I can't leave it. I have to fight for it. Young people are fighting for the reforms, but this is made much harder due to events surrounding the crown prince. On the 2nd of October 2018. Journalist Jamal Khashoggi is murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is suspected of giving the order, but the royal family denies it. As the news is reported, I try to gawk public opinion in Saudi Arabia itself. Ja. <laughs> laat vermoorden en uh, het is echt een ontzettend gevoelig onderwerp hier. Nou, eindelijk een krantenkiosk gevonden. Salam alaikum. Marhaba. Kif hal? Al Jirida al Yum? Ha? Al Yum? Jirida? Ja. Khabar al Sahafi? Oh, die is ook kullo maktoub, ook kullo hak al Yum jaraid. Nou, de man zegt dus dat hij niet kan lezen. Wat natuurlijk een beetje lachwekkend is als je een, als je een boekwinkel hebt. Maar het is eigenlijk gewoon een smoes om niet te praten over uh, wat het nieuws nu beheert in Saudi-Arabië. Dit zijn twee grote kranten in, in Saudi-Arabië. Maar echt bizar, de hele wereld heeft het erover, over, over die verdwijning. En allebei openen de krant met een foto uh, van de koning. En een fijn gesprek met Trump. En dat Trump Saudi-Arabië uh, steunt. Je zou zeggen van, nou, er staat een kritisch stuk over waarom maar 15 ambtenaren vanuit Saudi-Arabië uh, naar Istanbul zijn uh, uh, vertrokken. Er is ook een arts meegegaan. Waarom? Uh, dit zegt genoeg over persvrijheid in dit land. Je zou natuurlijk gek zijn om een heel kritisch artikel uh, te schrijven over uh, verdwijning van die journalist. Want uh, het zou zomaar kunnen dat jij dan zelf ook verdwijnt. It is not easy to survive for journalists in this country. 
Often, it is simply safest to remain silent. But Khalid al Maena, Khashoggi's editor-in-chief for 12 years, is willing to take the risk and talks. I was looking to Saudi newspapers. It was all the same headlines with the same picture. See, every newspaper depends on its own editors. Mm -hmm. There are those who want to, and there are those not. Today, in the Arab news, Faisal Abbas mm -hmm. wrote a beautiful article saying that, um, you know, after this sad incident, uh, things have to change. So I think it's important to have real journalists, yeah. people who care more for society, because journalism is not an easy thing. No. It it's is a very dangerous a, job yes. also. What happened is also acknowledgement about that there is no press freedom. What happened with this journalist? No, no, it was, uh, I, I'll be the first to tell you mm -hmm. that it was a total, not error, it was a mm -hmm. calumny, it mm -hmm. was a crime and all, and the government has accepted the fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of these things happen. Nobody's condoning. Mm -hmm. I'm the last person, because it could have been anyone, that these things should never happen again. I yeah. mean, this has happened, unfortunately. Yeah, but this journalist couldn't work in Saudi Arabia and flew uh, abroad. Because he, he, he said, I couldn't work yes. here in yes. Saudi Arabia. Was, I was you know his also. boss for 12 years. He had several issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I applaud him for this. But then he did went and all, and he said that he could not for fear of being taken aside. But you agree with me that things, uh, happenings like this, it doesn't make uh, Saudi Arabia's um, image in the West not very um, um, good. It, it doesn't make the image look good here. Yeah. You, you think that the people here approved of this? Believe mm -hmm. me. I am sure that the people who did this, and I pray to God that the people who did this will be taken to task, right. uh, it will be made public, and there should be no stone unturned to find out the motives of the killers and who were the killers. The editor-in-chief carefully weighs his words. He knows about the accusations against Mohammed bin Salman. Is it possible to criticize uh, MBS or his policy? There's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a way to do it. I mean, I have even been writing about the sponsorship system, which I think it was, and I wrote it in slavery. Mm -hmm. in, in McCann newspaper, I wrote in the Gazette and all. Nothing happened to me. Today, if there are elections, he will win hands down, mm -hmm. believe me. I will vote for him, not for somebody else. We don't want somebody who's, um, uh, archaic person, we don't want somebody who will take us backwards. Even Kasoji's former editor-in-chief draws a line at the royal family. Criticism is fine, as long as it isn't directed towards Mohammed bin Salman. Not just out of fear of retaliation, but also the fear of returning to the old Saudi Arabia. The only thing left to do is to attend this first mixed screening with Saleh. He tries to be proud of what has been achieved so far, but he knows his beloved crown prince has shown the world another side of him. Next week, I follow the pilgrim's trail all the way to the Holy Kaaba in Mecca. So God has given the power to Saudi Arabia. I think it is a gift from God. There is a call for moderate Islam, but do religious leaders support it?